Pints with Jack, Season 3, Episode 26. Trent and the Great Divorce. Good morning, everyone. Today is the promised follow-up to last week's bonus episode. So last week I posted an extract from my interview on the Council of Trent where I was talking about the screw tape letters. And today I'm going to share with you a section from the subsequent episode where Trent and I were talking about the great divorce. But before I forget, I have someone to toast. As I mentioned last time, if you support us on Patreon at $10 or more each month, we're going to toast you on the show. And today I'd like to toast Bob, Bob Maruna. So I once again have some of my engagement scotch, some of my Glenmorangie La Santa, and Bob, may you always go boldly forward into the high hills of heaven. Cheers. And with that said, here's the episode where Trent and I discuss the great divorce. Welcome to the Council of Trend Podcast, a production of Catholic Answers. And welcome back to the Council of Trend Podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. Today is part two of our imaginative supposings with David Bates, the co-host of the Pints with Jack podcast. Last time, we spoke about imaginatively supposing what it would be like to look at the correspondence between a senior demon and a junior demon, Screwtape and Wormwood, who are trying to tempt a man to give up on God and be damned for all eternity. And and in the process, we learned how to avoid those kind of temptations and get to heaven. And getting to heaven is another thing we're going to talk about today in our imaginative supposings about what it would be like to take a bus trip to heaven with stops at hell and purgatory along the way in very creative ways. So joining us again, Mr. David Bates. David. Welcome back to the Council of Trent podcast. And it's great to be back, and I'm glad that we're heading to heaven this time. <laughs> yes, we always got to start with the, the dark before we can end with the light. So we're going to go there. Before we get there, though, a special reminder, be sure to check out trenthornpodcast.com so I can continue doing the podcast and have great guests like David Bates on the show. Uh, also to have guests to engage me in dialogue and debates. So we'll be doing a debate on the Deuterocanonical Books and Scripture coming up here in April. A debate is on why are Protestant Bibles smaller, with the author of Why Are Protestant Bibles Smaller? You get an early access to that debate and other great sneak peeks of content, like sneak peek of my new book on socialism, co-authored with Catherine Pakalik at trenhornpodcast.com if you're a premium subscriber. Otherwise, consider leaving a rating and review at Google Play, iTunes, something I always appreciate. All right, so last time we talked about screw tape Letters, authored by C.S. Lewis. Today... We are going to talk about The Great Divorce, and I hear it's one of your favorites. It's probably my favorite book by Lewis, Uh, but it's also a book that a lot of people struggle with and they get confused by. So, Well, why do they get confused by, well, tell us a brief overview of The Great Divorce and what people find confusing about it. As you alluded to in the introduction, it's a a bus ride. It's a, a bus ride from hell, purgatory, heaven, and it's a story about souls from hell coming to heaven Mm -hmm. and like with a lot of lewis's stuff it's an imaginative supposal then the question is what if the souls from hell could visit heaven what if they had the option to remain would they choose to stay and i think that's an important way to look at heaven and hell because many people have a hard time with the doctrine of hell because they imagine i think that people in hell have been trapped there they made one bad decision in life Mm-hmm. And so a cruel God has basically locked them up, life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. And they're like trying to get out and get to heaven. And God's like, sorry, you broke the rule. You got to you gotta do the time. And so it's this sense that God is cruel for quote unquote sending people to hell without thinking perhaps that's exactly what they want. And Lewis has a great way with his imaginative supposings for us to understand how heaven and hell work outside of these kind of arbitrary confines we create for it in our minds. Yes, and we do have to emphasize, this is an imaginative supposal. Right. He is not saying this is what the afterlife is like. He is using these concepts of heaven, hell, and purgatory to 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 get to a deeper spiritual truth that he wants us to think about. Right, and I remember this one, I was part of a pro-life mission group, and so the first time I read, quote unquote, The Great Divorce, was we were listening to it, so this must have been... Oh, gosh, it would have been probably about 11 years ago. 
uh, when I, I heard it as an audiobook. So we were driving across country and our, our, the driver, the leader of our team played it as an audiobook to pass the time. And I loved it. I thought it was great. But what's funny is I only remember two elements of it. One is one of the stories that was heartbreaking. We'll get to later. But the other is the very end of the book mm-hmm. where Lewis reaffirms the point. This is an imaginative supposing. Don't take from this. that This is a literal description of heaven and hell. Nobody knows what that's like. And it ends, well, I, I mean, there's other, I'm not going to spoil it too much, but seeing the light of heaven hits our narrator like they're like solid gold blocks hitting mm-hmm. him, mm-hmm. like in the face, the light, the light <laughs> of heaven is just, the light is so bright, it's like gold blocks hitting him in the face, it's like, ah! And then what he, he wakes up and the blocks hitting him in the face are, are the books from his shelf mm-hmm. hitting him, yeah. falling on his head. And I just love that. It's just like a, and normally I hate it was all a dream uh, as, as a reference. It ruined that one season of of Dallas when it turns out Patrick Duffy was in the shower. It's like, it was all a dream. Nobody, nobody died. Uh, that was a deep cut there for our friends in, in pop culture history. But that, that it, it, to, for people not to take it too literally, because that was one of the complaints people had about the book. Yes. Then they read it and they're like, souls in hell can't go choose to be in heaven there's no you know it's appointed for men to die once and then there's a judgment lou's saying that's not the point i'm getting at here no he he has something deeper that he wants to talk about particularly with the relationship between virtue and vice sin free will choice and the desire for heaven and god's desire for us and so his book is sort of like it's in the vein of the divine comedy by mm-hmm. dante and for most people who have heard they probably haven't heard of the divine comedy but when they hear dante they usually just talk about the inferno yes. which is dante's imaginative supposing of what hell is like mm-hmm. which is very uh avant-garde very new for medieval literature to take a sort of poetic understanding of hell instead of a strict biblical interpretation where in dante's hell people are poison people are tortured by their own ironic punishments related to their sins it's sort of in that variant of genre for what lewis is taking us on this bus trip to heaven where he talks about heaven hell and and purgatory yes in in dante's inferno in the purgatorio and the paradiso the divine comedy as they're known together he takes a tour of those places hell purgatory and heaven and he has a guide uh, through this tour uh, first of all, it's the poet Virgil, who was mm. an author he really, really loved. And then later, it's Lady Beatrice, who was the love of his life. Right. So in The Great Divorce, Lewis also takes a tour of those places. And this time, it's with an author that he really admired, a guy called George MacDonald. Mm-hmm. Right. And so d- taking us through all of this, and what's fascinating here is that we also talk about purgatory, and Lewis was not Catholic. Mm-mm. He was, well, he was Anglican. Yeah. But And so he was a Protestant who believed that purgatory made sense. Maybe not the exact Catholic understanding of purgatory, but just this idea of purification. A post-mortem sanctification. Yeah, post-mortem sanctification of a person, which also there are other Protestants who are open to this idea. Jerry Walls, for example, is a Protestant author who's written a book called The Total Transformation, The The Logic of Total Transformation. It's a book on – sorry, it's The Logic of Purgatory – and it's related to the idea of complete transformation of the mm-hmm. person in Christ. Uh, and so Lewis saw that. And so hell and purgatory are tied together in this way. So let's let's talk about then the book. And it begins at a bus stop. This, a, this, a, this is so British. <laughs> right? So there were two individuals, two chaps who were waiting for a bus. They're waiting for a bus. What are they waiting for? Well, it's not waiting for the bus that matters. It's the fact they're having this conversation. And you're like, please don't. Don't talk like that. They're at a bus stop. I normally have to listen to Trent do his English accents while I'm listening to and this now podcast. And now you have to do it in live in person, my friend. Front row seat. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, the story begins at a bus stop. Lewis is our protagonist. He's in a gray, drizzly town. And it's in half light, so it's early evening. And he's in this bus stop, and there's this line, and people are quarreling, and they're fighting with one another, trying to get to the front. And after a little while, this magnificent bus arrives, and naturally they fight to get on it. But in the end, there turns out there's plenty of room. And the bus actually not only leaves the town, it leaves the ground. It takes flight. And Lewis can see this gray town sprawling out for miles and miles below. And he has some conversations on the bus, and he finds out that this town just keeps on growing. And the process is that when people come to the town, they move into a house, they argue with their neighbor, they can't stay close to them, so they move further away. Mm -hmm. It's that idea of hell is other people. Right, uh, (laughs) Sartre, hell is just other people. And so they get here, and then they live here, but they can't stand being next to anybody. And that's when we find out that this gray town is 
hell. Right. Although we later find out it's purgatory if you leave. And as we've said, this, this is one of the places where people trip up over this book. It's like, is this what he really means? No, he, he's, he's making right. a point we're, here. We're very strict in the, the Catholic, especially in the Catholic theological tradition, that the, those who die in God's friendship, the elect, do not go to hell in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the catechism says about purgatory, however, is that there is a, a purification of those who die in God's friendship for those who are still in a state of sin. But the catechism, though, in paragraphs between like 1033 and 1037, you'll find hell and purgatory doesn't say a lot about what the nature of purgatory is. No. That's something that hasn't really been, it's been given to some people in private revelations, but it's not something that the church teaches officially, this is what purgatory is like, similar to how we don't have official teachings about the exact nature of heaven or hell. It's mm-hmm. something that you only find out when you get there, and I'm happy not finding that out <laughs> about hell. Uh, so they, they go on this bus trip, and eventually, though, they, they get to heaven. Yes, they arrive in this beautiful land. And this is, this is where Lewis just is just his, his ability to communicate an atmosphere is just wonderful. He says, The light and coolness that drenched me were like those of a summer morning, early morning, a minute or two before sunrise. I had the sense of being in a larger space. I'd got out in some sense, which made the solar system itself seem like an indoor affair. So whereas the, the, the gray town was heading into night, here we are just before morning, and everything seems bigger and larger and more alive right. than anything he's ever experienced before. It's so funny. So if, if you were to write that today, it was like waiting for the sun to rise on a, a San Diego <laughs> summer morning. And then when you get to hell, it's like, Waiting for the sun to rise in Phoenix in July, <laughs> knowing it's 105 degrees even when it's not shining. <laughs> so I've so I've been I've done my own trip between both. So, uh, but I love the the details. This was a detail I also remember sticking out to me when I when I first heard it as an audio book. The grass was as hard as a diamond. Mm-hmm. As I I love the imaginative supposing. It reminds me of Holly Ordway is a wonderful writer Mm -hmm. and she talks about the need for imaginative apologetics and and to engage the imagination this way the grass is as hard as diamonds yeah lewis teaches us through the landscape we're going to spend some time talking about some of the characters that he meets and they're fascinating but even the land itself is telling us something about heaven and hell sin and grace virtue and vice as you say, the, the grass is as hard as diamonds. He tries to pick a daisy, and it's like picking up a bag of coal. Heaven is so much more real. And the thing that shocks him is when he sees his fellow passengers in comparison to the landscape. They're like a little smudge on, on some glass against this real landscape. They're, they are insubstantial in comparison. Right. So, And this it helps people to see that sometimes, once again, we, are, we think too small. And so when we talk about heaven and hell, we just think that hell is basically the end of Mr. Toad's wild ride at Disneyland, which it actually is. They don't say that anymore, uh, where you've got little little dragons with pitchforks and it's hot and there's fire. And it's like, you broke this one rule. So now you're here. And heaven is just another place you might end up with clouds and, you know, uh, angels and harps and music lessons. Right. But not. And so thinking that and I think what's hard is people imagine that. Heaven and hell are just different places, and I am just the same person in any of these things. And if I were in heaven, the experience would be like me being here on earth, but I I guess obviously better, or hell would be obviously worse. But not saying no, it would be dramatically different. And you yourself, now having died, the soul separated from the body, and the nature of sin, how it's affected you, seeing it very clearly and starkly, the nature of either sin or grace— will will show up here. Whereas like in heaven, it's so beautiful. If you're not prepared for it with God's grace, th- how real and beautiful it is, it's, it's almost like a kind of overwhelming thing you can't stand. It's like the light is too bright, mm. essentially. We think too small. We are too easily pleased. Well, Lewis gave a sermon. It's called The Weight of Glory. And he says, it's like we're a child that's messing around playing mud pies because he's got no idea what a holiday by the sea would be like. He says, right. we're the same with our sin and with our expectations. You know, we mess around with you know, lust and other stupid things, whereas the, this weight of glory is awaiting us. Right, or it's similar to people who have only had bad food, or mediocre and bad, mediocre and bad food, mediocre and bad music mm-hmm. uh, or art. And then when you're exposed to things that are objectively good and, and beautiful, there's like this disdain, like, ah, I don't like it. 
and you go you go back to playing with the mud pies and that's what he says that the citizens of hell when they go on this bus tour that's kind of how they feel when they get to heaven they don't they don't like that the grass is hard as diamonds well it hurts my feet i don't like it why, <laughs> why is it so hard here they need, to, they need to do something about this grass it's always like other people got to change i'm not the one who has to change absolutely because change is hard it's difficult it's painful it causes us to die to ourselves and that's what they are ultimately called to do because mm-hmm. they see these figures coming down from the mountain and they are people that they knew on earth, but they're now glorified. They're, they're saints. And Lewis calls them bright spirits and solid people mm-hmm. uh, because they are like the landscape. The, the grass actually bends for their feet. Right. They're, they, are, they are real and substantial and radiant. And they are coming down from the mountain and they each go to a different ghost in an attempt to help and encourage that ghost to come up back with them to the mountain. Right. And well, that reminds me of Hebrews chapter 12, which says that those who are in heaven are the spirits of just men made, made perfect. perfect. Just men made perfect. Uh, you, uh, you've told me that uh, Lewis wrote The Great Divorce as a response to William Blake's poem, uh, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, uh, and that there are no hellish souvenirs in heaven. What's, Absolutely What not. does that mean? So Blake... He had his book is very confusing. <laughs> if, you right. try, if you try and read it, good luck. But he ultimately seems to communicate that you don't ever need to come up with a hard either or. It's not like you ultimately have to choose God and reject sin. He sort of thought you could sort of work it out and eventually muddle your way through. Right. But the central point of the great divorce is that there can be no marriage between heaven and hell. That is why Lewis is writing of its divorce. One of his characters says, "If we insist on keeping hell, we shall not see heaven." If we accept heaven, we shall not be able to retain even the smallest and most intimate souvenirs of hell. Mm. I mean, in Revelation, it says nothing unclean can enter heaven. Right. But yet, and we know this, yet we still try and hang on to our pet sins, our favorite things, or at least the souvenirs of them, because we don't want to let go of them completely. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. And, and so that, that's once again, trying to get people away from their human oriented view of heaven and hell, where people have like this stupid idea, like, well, I'd rather go to hell because all the fun people are going to be there. <laughs> hell will have beer. Yeah. And so it's just like, and once again, you are chasing after things that pale in comparison to what awaits us in heaven. And that's unfortunate when it comes to William Blake, because actually, if you, if you are sharp, eagle-eared listeners, uh, in a previous podcast, I did one on poetry. I do enjoy the finer things in life sometimes <laughs> with my little finger sandwiches and my cucumber squares, uh, my favorite poems. And one of them is a poem by William Blake called The Tiger. Mm-hmm. And so tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, uh, what uh, immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that, that rhyme just doesn't work. But I okay. know, but you have to say it so that it ends up, so it ends up rhyming. Uh, let's talk then about the case studies. So the rest of the book involves the... the those who are in heaven helping the ghosts from hell slash purgatory to leave hell. And then, and once again, it's of their free choice that they, I've heard it put this other way that someone who is in hell, some the people think like, once again, the people in hell are like people who have been imprisoned against their will and we have to rescue them. But it's been said that if you took a soul out of hell and you dropped it in front of the gates of heaven, that it's smoking, you know, this smoking soul would uh, march right back to hell and curse God the entire way mm-hmm. when doing it, when he, when he, when he comes to see God. And th- those are some of these interactions we have with the different ghosts that are here. Uh, so one of them is the self-righteous man. Yes. So he's, he's a ghost who thinks he can get into heaven on his own merit. He keeps going on about his rights. And there is, there's a wonderful exchange between him and the, the solid person who comes to to take him to the mountain. Right. He says, I'm not asking for anyone's bleeding charity. And the, the, the bright spirit says, do it, do it at once. He says, ask for the bleeding charity. Everything is here for the asking and nothing can be bought. It's requiring his humility. But it's pride. He can't let go of his pride because it would hurt too much to say he needs other people to help him. Absolutely. It, 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 he feel he, that I think that, and sometimes I, I think of this way, we think that, what hell will be like for people who are there? And this is kind of more of the the Eastern view of hell, especially among Eastern Orthodox theologians. And I might do some research on this to see how compatible it is with how the church defines hell in the catechism. Because the church defines hell, catechism defines as the eternal separation from God. Mm-hmm. And how you cash that out, it may be possible. I'd love to incorporate Eastern insights into this. Because the traditional Eastern view of hell 
is that the fire of hell is God's love itself that the sinner desperately does not want to receive. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it, it, it causes pain and frustration for that person because they don't want to receive it because, because they've turned against God in this way. If, if you look in the Gospels, for example, Jesus says there's going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Looking at that construction and, and the, the original Greek and also the, the idiom referring to that, what I think it probably describes is not like someone who is just getting a pitchfork in their bum and they're gnashing their teeth. <laughs> But think about someone who is a total narcissist. Mm-hmm. And, like, you probably know someone in life who is an absolute narcissist who's just in love with themselves. But then when they're in the presence of someone who is legitimately better than them, like at a party, mm-hmm. and that person gets attention, it drives them crazy. And so they, they grit their teeth and they hate that they're not the center of attention. How's that person going to handle being with God for eternity? <laughs> you know, but that's that... That's that feeling. That's why it reminds me of uh, Brian Regan's uh, sketch about uh, driving on the moon. I don't know if you ever. No, <laughs> He's I a comedian. He, he talks about it. there's always that guy who tries to one up people at parties, just like, oh, you had two wisdom teeth. Taken. I had four wisdom teeth taken <laughs> out uh, without any kind of Novocaine at all. They had to use rusty pliers. Right? You know, he always has to one up people to be the, the more important one. My mom would always say if if somebody told him that they had a black cat, he'd say that he had a blacker one. Right. And so uh, there's someone who says, oh, I, the guy always, I, I got my new Ferrari Aston and I drove it on the Autobahn in Germany. And, you know, we were able to do 200 kilometers an hour there. And, and Regan says, I just wish that I was an astronaut <laughs> who had been on the moon. So when I hear guys do this stuff, I could just say things like, oh, yeah, yeah I don't get a lot of traffic. I used to drive on the moon. <laughs> you know, you drive the moon around there. Don't get to go that fast. No traffic on the moon. So that's also because I like Brian Regan because he's he's got a funny intonation there. But to take our detour all the way back to our bus trip, I think that when we see the self-righteous man as a perfect case study, I mean, that's so many people who think, why? I don't I don't need God. Like, I get calls on the radio all the time. One of the hardest calls, David, I deal with, and someone I ask, why aren't you Catholic? She'll say, I'm happy. What else do I need? Mm-hmm. I, I can do it all myself. Why would I need God? And it's that that either that apathy or that sense of I can do it on my own to break. It's like only the Holy Spirit can break through that. Yeah. It takes humility to look up. If you're prideful, you can only ever look down. Right. Let's take a look at uh, another one here. The, ooh, the theologian. Oh, he is my the, favorite worst character ever. <laughs> the the- it is when I tell people like, oh, you know, what should I do to study my faith? Well, if you if you really want to lose your faith, become a the- become an apologist, <laughs> become a theologian or an apologist. And Lewis wrote about this. He had that great poem, the Apologist's Prayer. Mm-hmm. And I tell people like, you will you will be attacked spiritually, emotionally, and pridefully to think, oh, it's it all rests on me. Mm-hmm. And, and then you think that you've seen the dirty insides of the bark of Peter. Uh, it was Monsignor Knox who once said, if you love the bark of Peter, which is the church, a bark is a ship. Uh, if you love the bark of Peter, stay out of the engine room. <laughs> you know, and then, but you have it. I mean, think about all the people like priests who fall away, theologians, mm-hmm. apologists. A lot of people I deal with are former apologists who become apologists for like atheism. Who's What's up with this guy, the theologian? Exactly. I mean, screw tape has been all over this guy because what he's done and, and the idea runs through all of Lewis's work, particularly in Screwtape and here. Evil isn't a thing. It's it's a privation. It's a twisting of something good. And here was a man who began his career as a theologian. He had questions, uh, a thirst for knowledge. But somewhere along the way, it ended up getting twisted. Mm. He, he would want to continue to ask questions, but he didn't really care about the answers anymore. It was all about the intellectual adventure And so he wasn't uh, asking questions to know more about God. In fact, he's kind of disinterested in God. And the spirit who comes to speak to him says, thirst was made for water. There there is a reason that that you had these questions in the first place. Right. Because there is an answer. There is an end. And he's just not really interested. All he wants to do is to to, to be useful where, where he's being placed. And that's enough of that. If you would like to listen to the rest of that interview, I strongly encourage you to go over to patreon.com and sign up for the Council of Trent. I think for just $5 a month, you get access to all of the podcasts that he puts out. Phenomenal value. And that's it for this episode. 
please join us again at the Eagle and Child pub to talk more Lewis next Tuesday, when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers.